So this mechanism explains why lift drops off for airfoils and eventually reaches a maximum. But to be able to quantify this in detail, we would still actually need to know M of S or delta star of S um, to quantitatively determine the viscous effects um, on the airflow. To do that, the boundary layer must be analyzed in detail. And this is our next topic. To make things even more complicated, the inviscid flow and the boundary layer flow are coupled so that they must be solved together. And this is what's done in x -Flow. We'll return to that coupling and how it can be achieved later. But for now, we'll focus on the boundary layer analysis. So remember, first, we looked at the effects that if we knew what the boundary layer was, how we would show what effects that has on the outside inviscid flow and how that leads to changes in lift. Now the second piece of the puzzle is figuring out exactly how we know what the boundary layer should be. And then the final piece will be coupling the two together. So to begin with, make sure everyone's on the same page. I'm just going to sketch an airfoil here um, and use this to introduce the gen general boundary layer flow features. So let's say there's a stagnation point here. Then boundary layer will begin to grow on the other side here. In general, it will start off as laminar. At some point, will transition and then become turbulent. A similar thing will happen on the other side of the airfoil and the transition locations in general will be different on the two sides. At the trailing edge we can sketch the velocity profiles. And as the weight continues downstream, essentially the velocity profile will no longer go to zero. And far downstream, the weight looks something like this. where the edge velocity becomes the infinity. And there's just basically a wide wake with a little bump in velocity in the middle. So as I said, it usually starts laminar, will transition to turbulent flow, where things are constantly varying in time. But when we talk about the U and V velocity components in a turbulent boundary layer, we'll be referring to the time average quantities. The two bat sides of the boundary layer merge to form the wake, and this far downstream wake governs the airfoil's profile drag, as we'll see later. So what we want to be able to do, three things. We want to be able to predict M of S and delta star of S, predict profile drag, and gain insight into general boundary layer behavior. Basically, what we mean by that is how the boundary layer responds to pressure, to pressure gradients. 
this is basically the basis of most aerodynamic design as we mentioned before because ultimately what we want to do is manage the boundary layers to minimize the profile drag and maximize the lift ultimately this typically means by delaying separation so what we'll assume is that the EIF exactly matches the flow outside the boundary layer. And is constant through the boundary layer thickness. This was as we had it when we developed the wake displacement body or the displacement body model. So what this means is that UI of S and N is equal to UE of S inside the boundary layer. This is equivalent to assuming that the boundary layer is thin compared to the streamwise radius of curvature, which, as we saw earlier, is generally a good assumption, especially for external aerodynamic flows. So now what we'll do is compare the mass, momentum, and kinetic energy flows between the real and the equivalent in viscid flows to define defect integrals and thicknesses, which we'll see will govern the behavior or the consequences of the boundary layer. So let's start with the mass flow comparison. At first glance, this might seem like the same thing that we did with approaching or with the approach we used to get the displacement body model, but in fact, it's uh, the same concept, but basically applied in reverse. Um, so if we start with the real flow, we'll have UE. So velocity profile u of n and integrating across that gives some mass flow m dot so this is the real flow the simple inviscid flow that we might imagine also goes to n e and i'll sketch for reference what the real full profile is, but in fact what we have is this. U sub i, which is equal to ue. And we'll call that mass flow m dot i. And then finally, And here's N E and here's a sketch. There's U E of the velocity profile. But now here's delta star. And there's U I such that this height gives M dot. And this is the displacement thickness. And the mass flow that would occur uh, in this height, which is what we find here, is m. So this is EIF with same mass flow as the real case. This one has the same area captured as the real case. And by comparing these three scenarios, what we see is that the mass deficit m is m dot i minus m dot. And m dot i is just the integral from 0 to any of rho e u e dn, which is just rho e 
be any constant and m is zero to n e rho e u e minus rho u d n which from before we have is u e rho e u e delta star and just remember that the definition of delta star is rho zero to n e one minus rho e over rho e u e d n so this simple EIF has additional mass flow m. So this m is a fictitious mass flow between the real and displacement bodies. And this is just sort of another way of looking at the origin of the displacement body model. But it makes it clear that on an equal mass flow basis, we need to remove this region of thickness delta star from the flow to compare the EIF and the real flows.